Thank you, Russell, and thank you for the organizers for, again, a phenomenal course, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. So we'll start. Uh, the key points I'd like to make, and I'm going to focus on these as we go along, is uh, the biologics really are the most effective therapies that we incorporate in our clinical practice to treat patients with inflammatory bowel disease. One of the most important things you have to do as a clinician is to select the correct patient. I think you've heard that echoed throughout the meeting. Uh, ideally, before complicated disease comes about. We want to address the safety issues as well before starting these medications in patients directly. Uh, Pre-treatment and post-treatment safety factors that need to be looked at and incorporated into daily practice. And also, it's important to get a response. And we know that combo therapy is going to give you the best benefit. But the issue is we need to profile our patients and select those that are appropriate for combo therapy and those which are not, and then optimize the doses. And these are the tenets which I'm going to focus on. So indications and drug selection, I think, is important. We have to look and say, consider the clinical scenario. Is it Crohn's or ulcerative colitis? What's the age of the patient? What's the severity of the flare? As you've heard echoed, the severity of the flare may dictate the appropriate use of the medication, but also the prognosis of the patient. Is a patient hospitalized? For example, someone hospitalized with severe colitis, our drug of choice for those that have failed steroids might be infliximab, as opposed to one of the longer-acting agents. Azathioprine is not a good choice, and the other biologics have not been tested appropriately in this clinical scenario. Are they refractory to conventional therapies? Do they have fistulizing disease? Do they have extraintestinal manifestations? Is this a post-operative scenario? Uh, is it newly diagnosed? And most importantly, what's the patient prognosis when choosing these directly? So there's a checklist of things you might go through when you look at the regulatory approval and the different studies that have been done. And these are included in the slides to look over uh, in the future when you have time. Infliximab, adalimumab, sertilizumab, and golimumab for the anti-TNFs whether it's luminal, fistulizing, mild to moderate outpatient or hospitalized patients, pregnancy data that we have in these, and extraintestinal manifestations. And the anti-integrins as well. We look at drug selection based on indication. Is it luminal, fistulizing, mild to moderate outpatient, moderate to severe hospitalized patient, pregnancy or extraintestinal manifestations as well? And we have various lines of data within the studies both clinical trials and otherwise. And then recently, the advent and the introduction of the anti-interleukin-1223 agent used to kinumab to our medical armamentarium. What's the data we have and what's going to be forthcoming? And it's early in its career in use in gastroenterology, so we'll learn more about this agent. One of the key things you need to do is you can only treat inflammation with these drugs. So make sure there's inflammation. Do a scope or do a cross-sectional imaging study to see if there is active inflammation. And that's important to do. We recognize from the SONIC trial that individuals that did not have inflammation, in other words, those that had no lesions, as is illustrated here, had less potential benefit than those that did have lesions. And this is intuitively obvious. You cannot treat patients that don't have active inflammation with medications that are made to treat the inflammation directly. So we look at different assessments of inflammatory status. We can look at symptoms directly. Fever, abdominal pain, bleeding, localized tenderness, weight loss, joint pain, cutaneous signs. And then look at laboratory parameters as well. Do they have CBC with a high white count, a high CRP, calprotectin, high sedimentation rate, the biomarkers, are they elevated in the patients you're treating? And then look at the target, the mucosa, if you would, the endoscopy, the cross-sectional imaging study, CT enterography, MRI enterography, and look to see what the level of inflammation is. Focus on your target, and we recognize well, in fact, that symptoms are inadequate to treat completely. We need to look at a target. Many times it's biomarkers as a surrogate, but the true endpoint we really are interested in 
is a mucosa. Do we heal that mucosa, or do we nearly heal that mucosa, as is recognized in many of the trials, for example, in Crohn's, complete healing or near complete healing is identical in outcomes, and we don't have a threshold above which that we have to achieve in an effort to induce a better outcome, less surgery, less hospitalization, and a better prognosis with less formation of strictures in patients with Crohn's. We want to confirm adherence. Susie Kane has really been a pioneer in that area, saying it's important to make sure the patient takes a drug to be sure it's effective. Optimized therapy, and we'll talk more about that, and Adam Chifus and the group in Beth Israel really had shown us you can do a incremental step up. You don't have to really go doubling the dose. You can do smaller dose adjustments in an effort to better treat patients. And it's really about the therapeutic drug levels, if you would, that we have in an effort to do so. And it's very important to engage the patient, and patient buy-in is important, because if they're not taking not wanting to take what you say to take, they're going to stop taking it, and you're treating in effective ways. The treat to target, it's well recognized, and Bill Sanborn and his group really put this on the map when it came to defining it. It's been used before in diabetes, hypertension. We look at glycosylated hemoglobin in diabetes. Rheumatoid arthritis has really been a pioneer in this area, but using it in IBD is only something recently we've recognized. We have active disease, we treat with an agent directly, we optimize that particular agent, uh, and then we reevaluate and we look at the target, the symptoms, the surrogate markers, and the mucosal ulceration. If we've achieved a good endpoint, we continue this, we reevaluate then periodically. If we haven't achieved it, we need to make adjustments to that particular medical therapy or switch therapies directly to better treat the agent. Safety is of paramount importance. Before we start an agent on a patient, we have to say, do they have infectious complications? TB we check for, Hep B, HIV in the right scenario, abscesses. CHF, severe CHF is a contraindication to the anti-TNF agents given the data from the Chung trial from years ago. Double the mortality, although it wasn't statistically significant, I don't think that's something we need to achieve significance in. There's clearly a large trend and concern. Demyelinating disorders, lymphoproliferative disorders, other malignancies, Jean-Fred, others have published data to say we can use these agents in patients with prior malignancies, but the reality is none of the trials have included those patients and they're often excluded directly. So it's how do you use this in those scenarios? And we learn that it's important to engage the patient and other physicians, oncologists, if you would, to say what's the risk and what's the benefit when treating such. Anti-TNFs, opportunistic infections are important. So look for these when patients come in. Do they develop, do they not develop? And treat appropriately with prophylaxis when it's medically appropriate. We exclude TB prior to initiation of therapy with various means. If uh, the individual has a suggestion of active infection, do a scope test to look for CMV, hep B serologies, vaccinations are important. Immune modulators we heard about from Gill, azathioprine 6-MP methotrexate being our main agents directly, and it's important to recognize that these are not effective as primary therapies when we look at those people that have had large studies done, Jacques Cohen and also Julian Panis has studied these and shown us directly, they're not as effective, but they can be used for more mild disease to moderate as opposed to the more severe. The lymphoma risk is the concern to the patient and also to the physician. The overall risk about threefold when we look at all the population cohort studies for azathioprine, current users higher risk than former users. And when we look at men, it's double the risk of women in using the anti-metabolites. We look at age as a risk, 30 to 59 is the best overall safety record. Under 30, about a seven-fold risk. Male under 30, nine-fold risk for lymphoma. But again, a small overall risk. Over the age of 50, the absolute highest risk of patients, one in 354 cases per year of follow-up. Methotrexate, Brian Fagan showed us this is effective to treat Crohn's. We can use it not only as active therapy for induction and maintenance, but also 
as an immunogenicity preventer. And it's not as been well studied for evaluation. Does it increase the drug levels as does 6MP and azathioprine? We recognize the side effects, the nausea, vomiting, the bone marrow suppression, hepatic fibrosis. So careful observation and monitoring of biochemical parameters, the ALT, the AST, is important. So when we optimize patients, we want to give them the best potential benefit for the medication we're using with whichever biologic this is. We can have symptoms not related to the active inflammation. We can have individuals having low drug levels uh, because of anti-drug antibodies, or they can have higher clearance. So they get the medication, whether it's infliximab or any other biologic, and it's cleared rapidly out of the system. So these are important things to look at. Additionally, resistance to anti-TNFs, where they might respond better to an anti-integrin or to an anti-interleukin-1223 as possible. And then finally, we recognize dose-limiting side effects as well. So the things you need to do to optimize treatment, give a loading dose. And whatever the agent is, use the approved loading dose directly. And then once you have that loading dose, obviously give a maintenance dose directly. If you can, it's ideal to use it in combination with an immune modulator if that patient does not have a contraindication to do so. And we have no data that's been prospectively and randomized done to say, do high drug levels do equally as well as combo therapies? So that's an important concept to remember. If you use an agent uh, in combo, monitor and avoid episodic dosing, and also dose optimize to avoid unintentional episodic dosing. So we can monitor patients either reactively or proactively as well. In a reactive way, uh, this is something where if you get an individual that comes in and they have confirmed active inflammation and they have a positive anti-drug antibody and a low level, escalate the dose or shorten the interval depending on the drug. If they have a low drug level uh, and they have no antibodies, that's not the same as having detectable antibodies directly. If they have detectable antibodies, switch agents directly. If they're therapeutic, then you need to switch to a different mechanism. In a proactive way, you can escalate the dose by small increments if you have no antibodies. And Adam Chifetz and his group showed us this directly. Uh, if you go up a small amount by 50 to 100 milligrams, you may gain benefit. And if you do monitoring based on his retrospective study, those individuals might do well, better so with monitoring than those that did not. And this was a retrospective review of their practice that was at Beth Israel Hospital. Paul Rutgeertz and the group then went ahead and said, let's look at those that are responders, and looked at 263 IBD patients. They responded to infliximab, and they looked at a trough level of 3 to 7. When they had undetectable antibody, uh, then they had uh, a low level. The dose was escalated to accommodate for that. If they had antibodies that were positive, then they stopped therapy. If they had therapeutic levels, they were continued. The outcomes were remarkable that dose escalation in patients with subtherapeutic levels had better control. If you look at the numbers, you can see. In addition, those that had too high levels could lower the dose of the medication, and it's cost-saving to do so when doing that, and there was retained disease activity, so it did not cause disease flares to come about. And why do you want to give concomitant therapy? Well, you want to look at the risk versus the benefit, but there's lower rates of infusion reactions, there's lower rates of anti-drug antibody formation, there's higher drug levels, there's also lower rates of loss of response over time, and there's no signal for increased risk of infection. In fact, the SONIC trial, it was a lower risk of overall infection in those acutely that were treated with combo therapy. So the benefit is clearly there. The drug levels are higher, as we've talked about previously. And in the SUCCESS trial, this holds as well for ulcerative colitis. So those that were on combo therapy, the infliximab plus the azathioprine, did better overall steroid-free remission response, and mucosal healing, as is illustrated in this graph here. 
what about low levels? Well, we want to dose accordingly. Um, the Belgian group just presented data at Digestive Disease Week, and what they did was to look at patients retrospectively that developed antibodies. And those that had an infliximab level less than three had a higher chance of getting antibodies directly. So it's very important to dose accordingly based upon adequate treatment. Low albumin is one of the best predictors of response to anti-TNF therapy. Prognostication is important as well, and we recognize give appropriate therapy to the right patient. We look at clinical factors, serology, genetics, and endoscopy, and we look at those that are high and those that are low risk. And then, as was discussed, the low risk for Crohn's, one might try budesonide or azathioprine, and those that are higher risk to use combo therapy. Step up for good prognosis, quote unquote, or mild to moderate patients, and top down is what is alluded to in the past uh, for poor prognosis. And we have different markers that portend a worse prognosis. For clinical relapse, you've heard from the other speakers, CRP, basal plasma cytosis on biopsy is a factor, um, calprotectin, and mucosal healing is an important predictor of prolonged response early on. So eight weeks out, if you do a scope on a patient that has been treated with a biologic based on data from infliximab, we recognize that there will be better overall healing of the mucosa. Colectomy, with high-dose steroids initially, there's a higher rate of colectomy in the future. Extensive disease, uh, early mucosal healing, again, is protective. Laurent Peyron uh, Bogeri has done a study and looked at five-year follow-up of patients with non-disabling and disabling cones according to the characteristics at baseline. And he found there were three factors that were important in predicting a five-year disabling course. Age, less than 40, perianal lesions, and steroids for the first flare. And the odds ratios are on the right. If you look at these directly and you see what was the positive predictive value of disabling disease? If you had two or more of these, you had a 91 to 93 percent positive predictive value of having disabling disease. So you don't need much to make you do poorly in the future. And these are things to look at directly. Um, Corey Siegel has presented data, a prediction tool to help children with Crohn's understand the risk. And understanding the risk is important, and it's really a system dynamic analysis. But the bottom line is this graph here. You can model what occurs with no treatment versus early treatment. And in an effort to do so, this may help patients better understand their outcomes and be more accepting to therapy. So to summarize, I think we have several things we need to do. Treat actual active disease. The benefit of concomitant therapy we recognize, and there's many lines of reasoning why to do this. Higher drug levers, fewer adverse events, less infusion reactions, less serious infections. There's better efficacy as well. Evaluate the secondary non-responsors. Round up the usual suspects. CMV, C. diff, look for fibrotic strictures, fistulae. Dose escalation. Uh, switch drug mechanisms when you have someone that has an ineffective response to an anti-TNF, for example, despite adequate levels. Perhaps a different mechanism is operating. Always consider combination therapy, but don't always use combination therapy. Um, avoid the use of methotrexate in women of childbearing age. That's a risk that many people shouldn't take. There's other options as well. Avoid episodic dosing. Load the biologics appropriately. Treat active infection before starting a biologic and document that it's gone at the time you start and prevent preventable infections with vaccinations. Thank you.